Hi, welcome to the Florida School of Holistic Living's plant profile. Today we are going to be looking at this lovely, sharp, spiky, beautiful plant here at Lake Louisa State Park. And this today's talk is on saw palmetto. And um, this is our lovely friend here, saw palmetto. My name is Shay DeGrandis and I am a community graduate and um, clinical consultant with the Florida School of Holistic Living. And I'm really happy to talk about this beautiful, beautiful Florida native plant that we have going on here. Saw palmetto, also known as Saranoa repens, it is the botanical name and is in the Araceae family. I believe I said that right, palm family. And Saranoa repens, Saranoa sounds like the word serene, um, although it's named after a man, Sarah Noah Watson, who was a botanist in, at Harvard back in the late 1800s, and the plant is named after him. His name also means serene. Perhaps he was a very quiet, serene man. Um, repens refers to the fact that this plant is a creeping plant. So if you can look in here a little bit, you will see that the plant, unlike when you think of palm trees and different palms that go straight up into the air, this one has a creeping quality. You can see how the trunk goes along the, along the ground. So repens is uh, creeping, so it has a creeping quality to it. And while you're down here, you might as well stay for a second, one of the ways that you can recognize saw palmetto is if you see along the edge here, it is like a saw. It is indeed very much like a saw, very sharp, um, mildly dangerous, so always be careful. And you can see it growing up here from the center. And so the different fronds, so these are known as fronds, and they come up from the center of the trunk. So everything grows from the center of the trunk. Um, you might know the food heart of palm, which is very popular. Uh, particularly in Spanish cooking. The saw palmetto can be eaten as a heart of palm, that center section. What we usually know of as hearts of palm are cabbage palms. Um, I don't suggest it for a number of reasons. I mean, it can be eaten. It's a very slow growing plant. So, um, you know, it's, it, I like to leave them alone because they take such a long time to grow. I guess if you were really, really, really hungry, you could get to the heart of that and um, eat it. But we generally use this for its medicine, which is the berries. Um, if you look here too, another way you can recognize it is the way that each one of these attaches to the stem. It's a flat line where all of the ridges radiate from the center. If you see something like a cabbage palm or other palms, oftentimes will be a point, more like a spear in that center. So that's one of the ways, besides its creeping, low-lying quality, you can recognize the saw palmetto from other palms that goes straight up. Uh, the palm, the saw palmetto likes um, various environments. It grows mostly in the southeast of the United States. I believe all the way to western Louisiana, southeastern Texas is how far out its range goes, down into southern Florida. So it's pretty specific to this area. Um, and again, it is a native, slow growing plant. Um, it likes sandy soil, as you can see here at Lake Louisa. We have overstory, it likes to grow under oak trees, on sandy ridges. It also grows out in the open in um, flatland, flatwood pine. So there's some actually on the other side of this tree, huge stands of it out there. Um, it also likes to grow on the edging of housing developments where it's been clear cut out of the landscape. Um, and you can use it actually as a landscaping plant and I will talk about that a little bit later in our talk. So it's creeping mode of spreading out. Um, it can, it is a very slow growing plant, but it can take over hundreds of acres of land. So as you can see here, this is one stand. There's another one back behind here. And you can see it'll also grow up a little bit into the, it'll grow up into the sky just a little bit. It doesn't get too tall. Um, 
but yeah, it'll grow up as well as out. And if you come over here, we are at the tail end, back end, end of the berry season, which you can see here within these are called droops. And this is where the berries come out once a year. They grow, they come out in spring. They flower with a yellow flower, um, which is very popular amongst pollinators. You might have seen it in the stores, saw palmetto honey. And this is where your saw palmetto honey comes from. And even the honey has really good medicinal qualities in it. Um, antibacterial. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic honey. It's a very tasty honey, too. Um, so it's really useful for pollinators, butterflies, bees. Absolutely love this plant. And then on each one of these, a set of yellowish, tiny yellow berries will come out. Those berries will turn green, sort of like a big plump green, I'm going to say about this big. <laughs> and then eventually those berries will turn black. And once those berries are black, that is when we would pick them and use them for medicine. Um, or food. So this is a food for all of the animals that live around here. Historically, it was also used as a food for the natives who lived in this area. And not just this area, but like all along um, the coast of Florida. So the Diegua, the Jobe, the Ais, the Tamuqua, Creek, Choctaw, Miccosukee, um, were all known for eating this fruit although it is not a terribly tasty fruit. <laughs> so I have actually, my sister has one of these in her yard and I have like put it in my mouth and it's, it's a, um, bitter and acrid and um, not the best tasting thing that I've ever put into my mouth. Just so you know, if you think that you're gonna go out and eat some saw palmetto berries, I don't suggest it. Um, the history of the plant, um, it goes back to pre-Columbian times, like even the Glades people, which were totally pre-Columbian, utilized the berries for food, as well as the fronds for housing, um, for shelter, for fibers, because as you can see here, if you look deep here, the cordage, you can make this into cordage and fibers for making clothes, um, all sorts of various things. This plant was very, very, very important to um, the people. They also use it as a general tonic, um, boosting tonic, and for urological disorders, so urinary tract disorders. Um, although the plant, um, the hearts of the palm are edible, as I mentioned earlier, there is actually no documentation of them being eaten by the native people here prior to Europeans arriving on these shores. So the first documentation or known uses of the hearts of the palm being used for food are not documented any time prior to the 1500s when the Spanish arrived. Um, so the, and as I understand, there's also a current drink, not maybe not so current anymore, um, that the Seminole will make with the berries called shop, shopi soft key. And soft key is still a drink that's drunk by the Seminoles, but they tend to use now either rice or corn for it. It's almost like a porridge or a gruel. Um, and of course, rice and rice specifically is a post-colonial food. So that it's interesting that, that it's used rice now and not berries, but they would mix the drink, the berries with a kind of like a some sort of substance make it a little bit sugary and then drink that and like a porridge nutritious very nourishing and warming food um the uh yeah i believe it's called jega and jobe that lived in the area along the east coast between sort of like indian river and jupiter inlet in that area um were known for eating the berries as well and um, legend has it, or written documentation has it, um, that a Quaker ship landed in that area 
uh, in the 1600s, early 1600s, and that ship was holding, um, what's his name, Jonathan Dickinson, Jonathan Dickinson, yes, the man who became governor of Pennsylvania twice after surviving his shipwreck and landing in that area, and he noted in his journals that those people in the area helped keep many of the people from the shipwreck alive, utilizing this particular food. Um, because of the way the Gulf Stream is in that area, that's why there was a lot of hurricanes and shipwrecks, and that's why a lot of the European ships that were coming over would land there. Um, so he, he mentioned in his documentation that the taste of this plant this berry is not very good. He says, quote, not one of among us could suffer them to stay in our mouths, noting that the flavor was similar to rotten cheese steeped in tobacco juice. As I mentioned, not the most flavorful food. Um, and, and William Bartram, who, quote, who was talking about it 150 years later when he was um, talking about the plants being used by the Creeks, he says, quote, a little, little bitterish, and stinging on the palate at first using it, but becomes familiar and desirable. So apparently, according to Bartram, you can get used to the taste of salt palmetto berries. Um, I personally, my favorite quote is from Green Dean on his website. Um, and he says that the black ripe berries of the Saranoa repens tastes like an extremely intense, very long lasting, exceptionally peppery piece of blue cheese. It is also very close in flavor to the gastric juices we sometimes burp up and coats our throat. Blue cheese, gastric juice, intense, mouth coating, near burning, not something to eat without a tracer. You have been warmed. Um, and then his final words, they are nutritious, but they do taste like vomit. So keep that in mind. I love him. I've taken walks with him. He's fantastic. Look up his site, eattheweeds.com. So you have been warned about actually eating these berries. Um, they were also known by the Seminole as the spring of life. And there's, um, there was something written about how possibly a bad miscommunication that Ponce de Leon then equated that with the fountain of youth and the spring of life. Saw palmetto berries, fountains of youth interesting correlation. I thought that that was sort of a nice little historical bend in the, uh, um, and in the early 1900s, you could buy a drink of it in Miami called Meto, as in Paul Meto. And the drink was uh, saw palmetto juice mixed with sugar and carbonated water, like a, like a little, almost like an elderberry syrup, but with saw palmetto berries. Um, so, one of the other things that happened with Dickinson when he was on this trip is he had his infant son with him who had con contracted a disease while he was traveling from Europe. And um, the use of the saw palmetto berries due to their very high fatty acid content and um, different triglycerides like capric, caprylic, caproic, lauric, palmitic, and oleic acids um, which were otherwise scarce in diets or available in diets for people to eat, um, those berries saved his life. And so, again, spring of life, they have a really high medicinal quality to them. Um, I wish I could show you some of the berries here, but I am fairly positive that they were eaten by all of the animals in this area because they are a prized nutritional source for the animals, you know, in places like Lake Louisa State Park or even in your lawn. Um, so in North America, according to Daniel Austin in his Florida Ethnobotany book, um, they were used medicinally as a diuretic, a sedative, anti-inflammatory for asthma, colds, bronchitis, coughs, diarrhea, prostate problems, and migraines. That pretty much covers a good portion of your body right there. So the berries are known for being pungent, hence the taste, sweet, warm, and although dry in your mouth, they can tend to be moistening and nourishing to the system. Um, they're mostly known in current Western herbalism for use in prostate problems and for urinary tract issues or like different urinary issues because of their diuretic 
um, more astringent properties. Um, they contain what are known as phytosterols, and phytosterols are compounds that are derived from plants, phyto, um, that are related to cholesterol, which of course we need in our systems. And according to the Linus Paul Institute at Oregon State, um, there have been many clinical trials that demonstrated that the daily consumption of phytosterols, not just saw palmettos, but other plants, um, can lower LDL cholesterol and help lower your cholesterol in general. And a few trials have also suggested that a, a low supplementation of, the, of this plant um, can improve urinary tract symptoms and things that are specifically related to what's known as BPH, which is benign prostatic hyperplasia, where the prostate expands and then has pressure up against the urinary tract. So the saw palmetto berry, not the rest of the plant, but the berry, is I'm going to walk around this plant for a little bit. There's some other, like, just like have like a little view of this plant from all sides. He's like, why are you only staying on this side? I got lots of sides to me. Um, so the actions of this plant are specific to the, also the glands of the reproductive system. So they help to make the activity of those glands more functional. And that includes everything from the mammaries, the ovaries, the testes, the prostate. Um, and they can work specifically with atrophying of the testes and the uterus. So things like that concept of it being moistening and nourishing, and again, those fatty acids to help nourish the body and nourish these glands so that they can work better. The idea isn't that you know, with all of herbalism, it's about the plant nourishing and balancing the body and not about the plant fixing something necessarily. So in that action of balancing and nourishing the system, then symptoms from other things can then be alleviated in that process. So um, one of the ways that saw palmetto works is that it reduces or blocks the activity of what's known as 5-alpha reductase which is an enzyme that converts testosterone um, to a different, a different sex hormone, which is known as dihydrotestosterone, and helping to up to, like change the uptake of that and block the uptake of D, what's known as DHT, dihydrone testosterone, um, can help do things like preserve and regulate testosterone levels. So particularly as men age and they get older and they're they have an inability to produce testosterone in the same way, which affects things like their prostate and their libido and their moods um, and just actual general bodily activity, muscular strength, all that sort of stuff. When your testosterone is lowered in that way, particularly as you age or through other things that happen, um, saw palmetto berry has been known to help with these sorts of issues and to preserve those testosterone levels. In that, it can also do things like help prevent hair loss. And that has been used by both men and win women in that androgen blocking receptor uh, way. So let's take a, I wanna keep walking around the pit because there's a whole other one of them over here. And I love this one, he's so tall. He's like, I'm tall. Um. So when, when men take this, it can do things like just improve their general quality of life. It can improve sex drive, muscular endurance, um, and sperm count. Cause yeah. So it can help improve prostate health and reduce symptoms from benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, and it's said more tests need to be made. And of course, this is one of those things where in herbalism with plants, you know, things again, like take a long time to test them because it's a slow process. It's not like you just take it. And there's been more research done in Germany about the use of plants like this, because in that area of the world, there's just more reliance on plants and more interest in herbal medicine in that way. And so if you look more towards German studies, you're going to find more information and studies about this sort of stuff. Um, again, help with hair growth. Um, it can also help tone that urinary tract as well. So for both men and women with incontinence as they age. So again, 
like having that toning and strengthening muscle endurance also like within our own muscles within our organs and our body um the constituents in the plant in the berry specifically have been also shown to have some estrogen like estrogen activity or estrogenic activity and it's been known to also help with women um specifically with ovarian enlargement um and different reproductive organs again it's mostly you want to think about like reproductive organs it does have help with coughs and bronchitis again that moistening and toning of the lungs um but what it's mostly known for is like reproductive and aging so um a few of the cautions with it it's also known again because of estrogenic activity and with its use of you know helping with functions of the reproductive glands it's known as an anti-galactagogue so it might actually cause um, difficulty in lactation in women who are breastfeeding so definitely don't take this while you're breastfeeding be very wary of any of these sorts of plants also when you're pregnant don't take when you're pregnant um, it's generally thought to be safe and not known to interact with any drugs but again when you're taking any sort of medication or herbal supplement always pay attention to your body and how your body's feeling and really notice um, because it can reduce the androgen and estrogen receptors in the body and have hormone effects it can have some effect on women particularly who have hormone related cancers like breast cancer that's estrogenic so again maybe stay away from that in that area and also oral birth control so it's not recommended to take saw palmetto if you are also taking oral birth control because again those hormone related effects that it has and the reproductive organs it might make it um not as effective and also so, if you are um an older woman and you're on HRT or hormone replacement therapy to also be aware of those effects that it can have because it can either double up with what you're doing or lessen the effect of what you're doing. So just be very wary when you're dealing with any other medications that are hormone, hormone related. Um, it can also interfere with the absorption of iron. So if you are taking any iron or you have anemia to just pay attention to that as well. Um, and again, with a lot of herbal medicines, you know, it can potentially affect your blood's ability to clot. So you want to make sure, um, you know, not to have any of these sorts of plants in your body before surgery. Like make sure they're out of particularly, or if you have any issues with blood clotting as well. Um, again, the berries um, can be known to help with benign prostate hyperplasia. But if you are taking a medication for it, as with any herbal medicine, always work, work with your doctor if you are on medication. So don't just go taking it because you don't want to contraindicate or overdo what your medicine is already doing. So just always work with a professional on that. So the berries um, can be made into a tincture. And I have, because we don't have any berries here on this particular plant anymore, um where did where did you put the oh in your pocket they're in her pocket always carry saw palmetto berries in your pocket just kidding so the berries can be dried and chopped up um i have made them into i have made the saw palmetto berries into a tincture before and i usually tend to powder it I dry it and then powder it because then you have more surface area of the berry to extract more of the constituents from it. You can tincture it like this, certainly, but if you powder it, you're more likely to get <clears throat> more of the medicine out of the plant because you have more surface area to work with. But you can just get an idea of what some of that looks like here. Um, the best way, my understanding of taking it is either through a tincture with, if you're using dried berries, at least 50% alcohol mixture to make that tincture. Um, you can also make a glycerite with it. it. Takes a little bit longer. You can make a tea out of it, but because of its, you know, when we think of plants and we think of making teas versus tinctures, obviously there's different constituents that are gonna be drawn out of that. 
I do believe that phytosterols can come out through the infusion process, but because these are so tough and hard too, once they dry, you'll want to decoct them first. So decoct them in water for at least 15 minutes and then actually let them steep for another 30 minutes. So you want to boil them a little bit first for a good 15 minutes, get the water going, and then turn it off, cover it, let it sit for 30 minutes before you take it. Again, can't promise it's going to taste delicious. And if you're going to be needing it on a regular basis, you're probably better off using a tincture or a standardized extract, which you can get from the store. Um, and the standardized extract is going to make sure that it has those phyto phytosterols and the betosiderol that or the active ingredients and the active constituents in the berries in those standardized extracts. Um, so supplement, capsules, tablets, those sorts of things. Um, as an herbalist, you know, we want to usually work naturally. Why are we here? We're at Lake Louisa State Park and we have these beautiful trees. And a lot of times in the, our plant talks, we talk about like having direct access to the plants. And I think being able to hang out with these saw palmettos and, and be around them and have conversation with them and, you know, talk to them about what their berries are and what their berries are doing and, and knowing the plant is really, really important. One of the things about this plant to note, though, is that foraging for it is actually illegal without a permit. So if you come out... Foraging in a place like Lake Louisa State Park is not, you can't do it anyway. You should never come to a state park or a nature preserve um, unless you have permission in some way from the preserve, but foraging in state parks is illegal anyway. Um, that said, saw palmetto grows in a lot of places. It grows in open fields. It grows um, out in parks. It grows in people's yards. My sister who lives out by Moss Park has large patches of saw palmetto in the back of her house. But why is it in the back of her house? It's because the rest of her yard was clear cut in order to build her house. And this is a very, very slow growing plant. And this plant, um, the berries are food for a lot of animals. And because of the demand, for the medicinal properties of this plant, like everything that I just said, let it, what are we talking about? We're talking about an aging population and we're gonna help them improve their quality of life, their sex drive, and you know, help out with their testosterone levels. Everyone wants saw palmetto. It's a very, very popular and can be expensive plant. So poaching for saw palmettos became a big business and people were going out into nature preserves, into protected areas, and literally taking large amounts of saw palmetto berries. When you take those saw palmetto berries, the animals can't eat, the palmettos can't reproduce, and again, slow growing plants. Um, and when they can't reproduce, then the animals continue to not have any food. So um, the plant, and also because of development, our own human development, the plant is becoming a little bit more scarce and a little bit more scarce and a little bit more scarce. And I know, for instance, in areas um, where entire swaths of land are just being cut out, a lot of saw palmetto is going with that. So be mindful to know that it is actually illegal to go anywhere and take the plant forage the plant if you do not have a permit to do so. That actually includes on your own land if you are using it for commercial purposes. If you plant a saw palmetto plant and you take the berries and make some for medicine for yourself or your family to be used in your own home, you can do that. Make sure to leave some berries for the animals, right? It's always important. The animals also want to eat. Um, I don't know how much they're worried about benign prostate hyperplasia. Maybe they don't have it because they eat so many berries. Bears don't get it as much as humans do, perhaps. I don't know. Um, so in places where it's already prohibited, like here in a state park, um, you have to have permission from the landowner in order to forage them. 
Um, that even includes family members. Like if I wanted to go to my sister's house and take berries, make a tincture and give it out to other people, I would still need a permit. I need a letter from her as well as a permit from the Florida Department of Agriculture. And I believe we'll be putting a link into this video down below to show you all the information that you need about those permitting processes. It doesn't actually cost anything to get a permit. You just need to have one. If you decide you want to go out foraging for the berries, keep not only your permit in your pocket, but also the letter from the landowner in your pocket. So that way you're not getting in trouble. Um, and if you are going out foraging with a friend, you say, hey, so-and-so, you want to come foraging for saw palmetto berries with me? Their name also has to be on the permit. So it's it seems like a huge process. And yes, it is. And this, this law actually is, from what I understand, was passed in July of 2018. So this is a more recent, this is a more recent law um, about having the permitting. Um, it's, it's the reason they're doing it. It's, there's an, I mean, obviously you're not making any money off of, you're not paying for the permit. It's just more making sure that we're not completely pilfering so much of the saw palmetto out of its natural habitat that we can't feed the animals that live here. Um, so this, this was put into effect by the Endangered Plant Advisory Council, and they wanted, they added the saw palmetto to the exploited plant list. Um, I have a friend who was working for the Florida Land and Wildlife Management um, Services, and one time they went out and they actually found people who were poaching on in in a park 75 garbage bags filled with saw palmetto berries in the season and the season is typically august to october but i think because it's been so hot and so rainy um they've already come and gone like i think the seasons are starting to shift a little bit with when the berries actually come out so they'll start flowering sometime late spring and usually it takes all the way up until august but it seems that Every place I've looked for them, there've only been like one or two berries left. And they've all ripened and gone away. And we're only at the beginning of September. So also thinking in terms of the way the climate is shifting, they aren't even hanging around that long. The berries aren't, like they seem to be ripening perhaps a little bit faster. Um, so if you want to go out, make sure you follow the guidelines. If you are a medicine maker and you want to make medicine from the saw palmetto berries, and let's say you have an Etsy store, not only do you have to have all of the permits, but you also have to have a bill of lading to ship the saw palmetto medicine that you've made to another state. So know that too, like if you want to like have an Etsy store or anything like that, and you're making any sort of medicine out of saw palmetto berries, even the ones on your own property, just check your, make, check, just check your list and make sure you have everything that you need so that you're doing it you're doing it legally. Um, yeah, so just if you're using it, I don't know if that counts for like making it and like sending it to your dad in Arkansas or something. I don't know if that counts, but just to just be wary of, of what you're doing. Um, so I just, I wanted to, ha I had a list of like all of the animals that this, this, this plant feeds. So it feeds the raccoon, the fox, black bear, gopher tortoises, wild-tailed deer, feral hogs, water birds, fish, and butterflies. And it says it's, um, it provides food or cover for about uh, over 100 birds, 27 mammals, 25 amphibians, 61 reptile species, and numerous butterflies. So it actually covers like well over 200 and some odd species of wildlife. Um, and so you're, if you take too many berries, you're taking food from all of those animals and you're preventing the plant from being able to grow. And actually, let's look. I saw one over here. Of course, you can see this is a trail. So here's one little baby. This, the seed made it all the way over here. So you can see how slowly this little guy is going to grow. He takes a while to get up there. Um, 
So you can grow this plant on your property. It is known as a landscaping plant. You can buy plants and grow them on your own property. Um, know that they work well under established trees. They can grow out in sun. They tend to get taller in the sun and they tend to spread more in the shade. Um, it is difficult to move once it's established. Most palms are like that. Like once they get into the ground, if you make a decision to plant a saw palmetto, make sure that that is where you want it because it is not going anywhere once you get it in there. And as you can see, they do spread out. Um, it's also flammable. So if you're practicing any sort of fire wise landscaping techniques, you want to make sure far away from your house tends to be better on the edges of your land. It's also a very spiky plant. So you want it in some place where it's not near walkways. It's not near playgrounds. You don't want it like where you're going to be getting in and out of your car <laughs> because that, like we said, that saw blade is very sharp. This is not super pleasant. Um, to run into, <clears throat> you know, and it's, it's salt tolerant, it's drought tolerant, uh, and easy to take care of plant because it is so native and sprawling. Um, it just needs, see these guys? If you had this on your property, you would just prune regularly, and then you would actually be able to see better the beautiful trunk that comes up out of the ground. You can see it on this side here, how it has that, like, Repose. I always think of it as serene repose. That's how I remember the name of it, Saranoa Repens. Serene repose. I'm just lying back here and trying not to poke anybody with my sharp, sharp, sharp blade. Um, and so again, like, just remember if you are going to forage and you found a safe place, like on a family's property or, um, no, just don't take it all. Never take everything whenever you're foraging. Um, another thing that this plant is known for, to pay attention to, is you can see it has a lot of nooks and crannies. And the way the palm fronds can lie flat. These areas, so when you're not watching out for Florida Wildlife Management, <laughs> and you're not paying attention to like the, the foraging police, pay attention to things like the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake, who loves to live in here. Why would the rattlesnake love to live in here? Because it's a food source for animals that he likes to eat. He's like hanging out in their food source to like be like, hey, what up? You are not his food source, but that is not going to stop him from biting you. So pay attention to things like rattlesnakes, other animals will use this as shelter. Again, raccoons. It's a little bit, black bears don't so much hang out in them, but like smaller animals such as raccoons. And um, they have this like beautiful squat, spiny overstory um, to hang out in. Um, and the rattlesnake also like to go up and hang out because they can cool off in the shade and get off the hot ground. So that's the other reason that they like to be in there. So be particularly watchful for things like raccoons and feral hogs and also just other animals in the area. Um, yeah. I love you all. Thank you for visiting the Florida School of Holistic Living. Check out our classes um, and you can learn so much more about this plant and other, and other medicinal and culinary plants. Um, we would love to share that with you. Subscribe to our page, check out our Instagram, all that jazz, the social media sphere out there in the world and if you have any comments or questions look for us um at our website the florida's holistic living school i believe it is yes there will be a link underneath where i'm standing right now.